Good morning, everybody. This is Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is Chair Michelle Espinosa, and I'm calling the Real Estate Commission meeting to order on Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. Good morning, everybody. Um, Marsha, may I get roll call? Good morning, Marcia. Can I get roll call? Yes, yeah, sorry. Zoom is not liking me today. That's Michelle okay. Here. Graham Kaltenbach? Here. Renee Lines? Here. Joe Chang? Here. Josh Broadbeck? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. May I get a motion for the approval of the February 6, 2024 Real Estate Commission meeting minutes? So moved. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Any other discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Do we have any public presentation of issues not on today's meeting agenda? Anybody from the public, if you'd like to address the commission, just please hit the hand icon. And Madam Chair, we have Gary Wolf. Gary, you should be able to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I had a problem at the last meeting in December, so I apologize. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> hello, Commissioners and Director of the Division of Real Estate. Uh, my name is Gary Wolf, and I own CompareTitleCompanies.com, which is a marketing tool for title companies and notably a free educational resource for consumers and real estate brokers. As you know, back in March of 2023, I submitted a comprehensive request to the Real Estate Commission for the purpose of creating a disclosure of information, duties, and authorizations regarding title insurance and closing settlement services again, designed for the benefit, education, and protection of consumers as well as brokers. As stated in my email public comment sent to the commission meeting of December 5th, I questioned some of the remarks of the forms committee's November meeting that really failed to discuss the real substance of the consumer and broker issues that addressed in my request. I was uh, subsequently informed after the December commission meeting that my request is still on the commission's Forms Committee Global form list and waiting for what today I still don't know. Uh, and that's the purpose of my inquiry here. It appears the Commission and its Forms Committee are intentionally avoiding this requested disclosure due to the negative ramifications that would affect many of its licensed real estate brokers, regardless of the overall positive benefits to the consumer, in my opinion. As you know, consumers rely on the expertise and duties of the real estate brokers in representing consumers' best interest, which should include a substantiated recommendation of title companies for consumers to choose. For years, brokers have always had the ability to obtain free online quotes of title insurance and closing costs from the websites of title companies. However, most brokers and, and unknown to their clients never check out these websites and costs and just make a recommendation based on their own self-interest, causing unknown financial harm to many consumers. Interestingly, many brokers, real estate trade organizations, and regulators have claimed that compared title companies is seeking regulation that enhances its business model, which is false. It's important to point out that compared title companies can conveniently pr produce in just a few minutes a comparison summary of all available title companies that is based on the title company's file rates and closing fees with the division of insurance. And that such comparison is also free to real estate brokers and consumers. Why wouldn't a broker want to check out any free online service that could save their client money and also better protect their client's real estate closing transaction with the closing protection letter? My request is not about CompareTitleCompanies.com, but about brokers providing consumers with accurate information about available title insurance and closing settlement services and the cost for the consumers to choose. Thank you and I'll answer any questions if you have. All 
right. Thank you. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Gary or any discussion? No. Marsha, this being on the, the global list, can you give us a refresher on how that works on just being on the global list for review um, for the forms committee? So they kept him on the vote global list because they thought he made some valid points. The reason that it's not moving forward this year is because they've got a heavy lift with working on the CBS, along with some of the other forms that they're working on. It was just, they didn't have enough time to work on this. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the commissioners? All right. I don't think so. I think that was the same question that I have basically about the global forms list. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Gary, for joining us and breaking that um, up in the meeting. We appreciate your time. Thank you. If there's any other members of the public, um, that would like to address the commission, please hit the hand icon. And Madam Chair, I do not see anybody else. All right. Thank you so much. We are on to um, policy matters. Uh, Marsha, it is all yours. Um, and actually, I will turn this over to David Donnelly. This is uh, for your consideration, appointment of the Education Task Force members. Good morning, commissioners. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, as, as the task for, or as the manager of the education and the communications and policy program with the, the Division of Real Estate, I'm joining you today to present you with the 2024 Colorado Real Estate Commission Education Task Force members. Uh, we do this annually, and uh, today I'm very pleased to present you with an excellent group of individuals. Uh, the task force members have a wide array of qualifications and skills, ranging from actual real estate brokerage experience to being instructors and educators. Uh, we have associate brokers, we have managing brokers, we have property managers, we have attorneys, um, uh, and, uh, and we have investigators uh, um, uh, amongst the uh, division staff members that I will identify momentarily as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so as, as you might know, the education task force primarily uh, 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 assists with the required annual commission update course materials, but it also assists with other matters that may come before the division from time to time. The goal of the task force is to review and improve policies, as well as the experiences um, of brokers all the way all across the state of Colorado. So with that being said, um, uh, for the year 2024, uh, the Division of Real Estate has identified the following individuals to serve on the education task force. Um, uh, the initial stakeholders would be Patrick Armbrist with Armbrist uh, Real Estate School, Heather Bustos, who is an employing level broker with Compass Real Estate, Damian Cox, an attorney and an educator with Cox Education, Jesse Farnloff of the Colorado Real Estate School, Todd Franklin, an employing level broker with Coldwell Banker, um, <clears throat> Dana Garrett, uh, a real estate agent with Front Range Real Estate as well as uh, an educator with Colorado Real Estate School, John Gillum, uh, an employing level broker with Exit Realty and an, edu and an educator and instructor, Rob Lind, uh, the managing broker of Milestone Real Estate Services and property management, uh, and he is also a property management broker, Beth Ann Mott, an employing level broker associate with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, uh, Colorado Real Estate LLC, and the Envision Home Team, and she is also an educator and a trainer. M. Eric Romero, the Director of Broker Brokerage Management with Your Castle Real Estate. And then uh, on the division staff side, um, we've identified Patricia Hardy, uh, with the, uh, who is an investigator with the Division of Real Estate. Um, A.J. Jackson, the uh, uh, Senior Education Specialist with the Division of Real Estate. And then, of course, myself as well as the manager of the education, communications, and policy uh, program. So, 
if you deem it appropriate. Um, I would respectfully request that you can approve the real estate uh, task force members for the for the year 2024 and um, uh, by a motion and then of course by a second and a vote. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much. May I get a motion to approve the 2024 CREC Education Task Force members? Uh, motion to approve 2024 uh, CREC Education Task Force members. Great, we have a second. Aye. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. So Commissioner, the next item is whether you have anything that you would like to discuss at your next meeting in June. I don't have anything. I don't either. Oh. All right, looks like we have nothing. <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity really quickly just because we have two commissioners that won't be continuing on, um, Josh Brybeck and Joe Chang, and I would like to thank them for their service. Um, I know that they have done an excellent job at volunteering to help out with case mediations as well, um, along with just serving on the commission. So thank thank you both. Yes, thank, thank, you. Like that. thank you so much, both of yes. you. Thanks. It's been great to serve alongside you both. Yes. Well, and I just want to say then, if we're doing this now, um, I just want to thank the division staff. I think you guys do a job that's very, it's undervalued and under unappreciated. So again, thank you so much. I'd like to echo Joe's comments. I always felt very well prepared um, for not just our meetings, but uh, in new meetings. Um, and I know that the staff works really hard to make sure that happens. And uh, it's been a pleasure serving alongside all the yeah. other members on the commission, and it's been my honor. So, um, great to meet you all. All right. Well, thank you. We are going to move on to complaint, investigation, and audits. So, commissioners, complaint, complaint matter A is case number 2023-2468. This was an investigation done by Rob Walker. He's here to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, the complainant hired the respondent's husband to complete an auction uh, and estate sale following the death of his wife. The respondent and her husband photographed and inventory the complainant's household possessions and arranged for an auction to be held within weeks. The complainant alleged that the estate company held an auction and sale but did not pay him for the proceeds of, of the sale. Additionally, the respondent allegedly took a clock with an estimated value of $3,500 to their shop, sent a sales form to the complainant to sign, but never provided any proceeds or returned the clock. The respondent failed to, to respond to the complaint as required by commission rule. Possible allegate, or possible violations are 12-10-2171M, violation of any commission rule or part four, 12-10-2171W, dishonest dealing, and commission rule 6.25, must submit a written response to a complaint. Recommended discipline is a final agency order, public censure, revocation, and a fine of $5,000. Uh, and we'd like to directly refer this to the AG because they've got the other case with this respondent. Great. Any questions or comments on this case? Um, I do have a question and I, this is not a challenge, it's just a question. Um, I, I, on revocation, I just think I'm gonna start asking um, mostly why you know the CREC is um, seeking revocation. It's not a challenge, I just I would like to hear why. So this is the second complaint where it appears that this respondent is part of the, part of the legitimacy of the auction model is her broker's license. And in the first complaint, which I uploaded just to refresh your guys' memory, mm -hmm. she took, she took $1,300, I believe it was, and never returned it. Again, we have another person and it also appears that she is preying on um the elderly who are going through times of good morning uh, this is marcy um so that's the recommend that's the reason for the recommendation for the revocation okay great that was exactly what i was thinking as well thank you
Any other questions or comments? I wanted to ask the rest of the commission if we might want to uh, consider increasing the fine so that it's more proportionate uh, to the damages that were done to the complainant. What What are your thoughts? It's being referred to the AG's office, and they I think they will deal with the financial aspect of it. Isn't that correct? So well, we're recommending maximum fines as it is. Yeah, it, Josh, it's only two, two violations. And so the max on that would be $5,000. Understood. Any other questions? Hearing none, may I get a motion? Uh, an investigative matter A, I move to approve staff's recommendations as uh, presented. We have a second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. So, Commissioners, complaint matter B is case number 2023-2424. This was another investigation completed by Rob Walker, who's here to answer any questions that you have. Um, this is essentially a a uh, criminal conviction investigation that was opened on behalf of the commission after the respondent failed to report his November 2nd, 2023 conviction for assault in the third degree, which is the class one misdemeanor. A notification letter was sent on December 6, 2023, um, and the respondent sent a response along with some of the requested documents on December 27, 2023. Possible violations are 12-10-2171N, conviction or plea to specified crimes, 12-10-2171P, failure to immediately notify the Real Estate Commission, 12-10-2171M, violation of commission rule or any part four, and then rule 6.23, immediate notification of conviction, plea or violation required. Recommended discipline is a stipulation for diversion, a $500 fine, and probation to run concurrent with his criminal sentence. Any questions? I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, staff recommendations. Thank you, Josh. Do we have a second? Second. You. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. So complaint matter C is case number 2023-1832. This was an investigation completed by Rob Walker, who's here to answer any questions that you have. Um, the complainant, a licensed broker and the buyer, accused the respondents of negligence and dishonesty, stating he allegedly failed to obtain repair bids, ignored messages, and did not have, an ins did not have inspection items repaired to the contractual requirements. The respondent said he effectively represented his sellers, abided by the terms of the contract, and closed the transaction. An amendment to the contract that stated the seller would have a licensed general contractor contractor complete the repair items with the payment coming from the seller's proceeds. The complainant provided some repair item text messages from uh, after the closing, but there were no written records of who was responsible to get the bids prior to the closing. He told the investigator that his contractor repaired it, but the seller told the investigator that he had, in fact, fixed the issue. Possible violations are 12-10-2171C, uh, deliberate misrepresentation, false promise, and 12-10-2171Q, unworthy and incompetent practice. Recommended discipline is a stipulation for diversion, coursework and ethics, and a fine of $500. Any other questions or comments on this one? I'd like to make a motion to approve staff recommendations. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. So commissioners, complaint matter D is audit number 2023-108. This is an audit performed by Betsy Meredith, and she's here to answer any questions that you may have. 
This audit was a stipulation audit, which resulted from a previous complaint, though the respondent has made movement towards compliance. The reconciliations included ongoing negative ledger balances, which indicates that other owner funds are covering payments. The attorney drafted forms do not include the full verbiage required by Rule 7.1. The brokerage disclosure to tenant is uh, being obtained after confidential information is given, and the full registered DBA is not being utilized in all circumstances. Um, in the course of this audit, this respondent transferred the employing broker responsibilities over to her husband, which is uh, Commission Matter E. For this audit, the possible violations are 12-10-217-1I, converting, diverting, commingling funds, 12-10-217-1M, violation of any commission rule or part four, rules 5.9, diversion, conversion prohibited, 5.14, record keeping requirements, ne negative ledger balances, 6.5, brokerage relationship disclosures in writing, 7.1, standard forms, and 6.10, advertising using more than one trade name. As you'll see in complaint matter E, as it transferred over to a different employing broker, the issues were addressed. Um, and we are recommending that basically this gets dismissed um, as the issues have been resolved due to the transfer of supervision. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I get a motion? A uh, motion to accept staff's recommendations of uh, dismissal. Move a second. Second. Thank you, Joe. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. So complaint matter E is audit number 2023-124. This is the companion case for the last item on your agenda. This was an audit completed by Betsy Meredith. She's here to answer any questions that you may have. This audit was open on the respondent during the required stipulation audit being conducted on his wife. This was due to the fact that this respondent became the responsible broker during the audit. During that audit, it appeared that the majority of the items that the brokerage firm had been disciplined for previously continued to be ongoing concerns for which this responsible this respondent was now responsible for. Concerns included lack of compliance with uh, Commission Rule 7.1b attorney forms, providing the broker disclosure to tenant in a timely manner, trust account labeling, reconciliations that included negative ledger balances, indicating conversion, interest being sent to Carhoff without tenant consent, and concerns surrounding advertising. By the conclusion of this audit, these issues were all corrected. Possible violations include 12-10-217-1M, violation of any commission rule or, or part four, 12-10-217-1I, converting, diverting, commingling funds, commission rules 5.9, conversion, diversion prohibited, 5.14, record keeping requirements, 7.1, standard forms, 6.5, brokerage relationship disclosures in writing, 6.10, advertising. The recommended discipline for this is a dismissal with a letter of concern. All right, any discussion? Hearing none, may I get a motion? I'll make a motion to accept uh, staff recommendations. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. So commissioners, com complaint matter F is audit 2023-120. This was completed by Betsy Meredith. She's here to answer any questions that you have. A routine audit was open on this respondent and the following was observed. Prior to the audit, the broker was holding security deposits and rents in her own personal account that included her own personal transactions. Trust accounts were segregated during the course of the audit and are now in fiduciary accounts. However, the respondent has been unable to provide a compliant reconciliation for either account. The respondent was conducting business under a non-licensed company. This was corrected during the audit. The respondent was not providing a BDT, BDA, conflict of interest, lead-based paint, or radon disclosures. This has only been partially corrected during the audit. 
The respondent had drafted her own lease and management agreement. Forms have been partially corrected during the audit. The respondent did not have an accounting control or broker's relationship policy. These were provided during the audit. Possible violations are 12-10-217-1H, failure to account for funds received, 12-10-217-1I, inverting diverting commingling funds, 12-10-217-1M, violation of any commission rule or part four, 12-10-217-1Q, unworthy or incompetent practice. Rule 5.1, establishment of internal accounting controls. 5.14, record keeping requirements. 5.10, commingling prohibited. 6.2, competency must either possess experience, training, or knowledge. And 6.5, brokerage relationship disclosures in writing. Recommended discipline is a stipulation for diversion, a $1,000 fine, coursework and trust accounts, and a follow-up audit in 90 days. And I overlooked, there's a couple additional potential rule violations. There's 6.17, conflict of interest, 7.1B, attorney forms, and 6.4, brokerage relationship policy. Uh, Betsy, I do have a question. Um, in this in this audit, was the respondent um, cooperative? During it, I'm. Do you get a, a feeling of why these are only partially being done or corrected? I, I can't really speak to her intentions. I mean, I, I believe to the best that she could, she was sending me responses. Um, she did respond to everything that I asked. It just wasn't complete. Okay. And Does correct. It Go Sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the audit process, um, as we've seen in a case just before this, is, is kind of a lot of education, right? If they're not understanding, you guys kind of educate them kind of on what what you're looking for and, and why. So I provide resources. I mean, we don't give practice guidance or legal advice, but we do have numerous resources and she was provided those resources on numerous occasions. Okay. Sorry, Graham, go ahead. No, I mean, that, that sort of um, touches on what I was going to ask as well. Um, you know, throughout the audit process, does she seem like she's moving in the, or does the respondents seem like they're moving in the um, right direction? I mean, do we have, you know, do we sort of get the impression that a follow-up audit will sort of, um, you know, have the remediating effect that we're kind of hoping for? There were some aspects corrected during the audit. Um, it yeah. wasn't they weren't all left out of compliance. And there are some aspects, specifically the trust accounts and reconciliations um, that I have yet to get a compliant reconciliation. I can't speak to what she'll do in a second audit, but okay. in this audit, there were aspects of compliance that she made. Okay. Thank you. I said, it was concerning that this couldn't be balanced because there are only six properties that are managed. Isn't that correct? Yes. It was six properties this should be relatively easy to correct and get on the right track. The fact that it hasn't been is concerning. Um, I had a question. In a follow-up audit, would the follow-up audit be a comprehensive audit or would it only be targeted on the items that are listed in the notes? So when we do a follow-up audit because she was just audited um, and I cleared what I could. Typically, we do a follow-up audit um, on the items that remain out of compliance. It's a narrowed scope audit okay. unless the commission wanted something different. And it's going to be identified for her what she needs to fix. Okay. And it seems like that there's still a lot there that's only partially corrected. So it seems like maybe the follow-up audit would be fairly thorough correct okay all right any other questions or any discussion hearing none may i get a motion um in commission matter f i move to accept uh staff's recommendations as presented we have a second Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor? Motion passes. Complaint matter G is audit number 2023-78. This was an audit completed by Betsy Meredith. She's here to answer any questions that you may have. This audit was opened after division staff learned that the respondent purchased the business from a broker who had had his license downgraded due to numerous violations. Given this respondent had been audited in recent years, the audit focused on a review of the absorption of the purchase business. During the audit, it was determined that the respondent's reconciliations did not reconcile prior to the purchase of the business and have remained out of compliance with negative ledger balances after the purchase business was absorbed. A compliant reconciliation on any of the six accounts the respondent now has was never provided. Additionally, minor concerns with attorney drafted forms and advertising were noted, but corrected during the audit. Potential violations are 12-10-217-1H, failure to account for funds received, 12-10-217-1I, converting, diverting, commingling funds, 12-10-217-1M, violation of any commission rule or part four, 12-10-217-1Q, unworthy incompetent practice, commission rule 5.14, record keeping requirements, 6.3, employing broker's responsibilities and supervision, 5.9, diversion conversion prohibited, and 7.1, standard forms. The recommendation is for a stipulation for diversion of $1,500 fine and a follow-up audits within three months of the signed stip. And sorry, commissioners, again, there were a couple additional potential violations, 610 advertising and 5.1 accounting control. And Betsy can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any discussion on this one? Hearing none, may I get a motion? Um, in Commission Matter G, I move that we accept staff's recommendations as presented. We have a second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. The next is complaint matter H 2023-1889. The respondent engaged in a deceptive business practice involving flipped houses. On June 15th of 2023, the respondent pled guilty to a felony three charge of securities, fraud, or deceit. She was sentenced to 90 days incarceration, 10 years of supervised probation, Court costs and fines in the amount of $381 and restitution with interest in the amount of $1,791,432.53. It was confirmed that a payment plan of $25 per month is in place. Po possible violations include 1210-217-1W, dishonest dealing. Disciplinary recommendations are public censure, a final agency order, revocation and a fine of $2,500. And Investigator Gabardi can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I get a motion? I move to accept uh, staff recommendations. We have a second. 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 Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Complaint matter I is complaint number 2024-189. And the agenda has the wrong letters next to that. It should be CH. Um, the complainant alleges that the respondent shared access information to the property with his buyer without authorization. Possible violations include 1210-217-1M, violation of any commission rule or part four, and rule 6.16, access information. Disciplinary recommendations include diversion and a fine of $500. And again, Investigator Gabardi can answer any questions. I have a question. Um, I, I'm going from memory from the report, but is it, Am I remembering correctly that uh, that this 
this respondent gave access um, to a buyer that they had not yet met. Is that true or am I not remembering that correctly? That is correct. That's correct, okay. That is correct, sir. So one thing I wanted to ask the commission is that, I mean, that if this respondent effectively gave access to a property to someone they hadn't even met, um, should we consider a fine that's a little more serious than $500? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there, Josh. Um, I really struggled with, you know, not only that, you know, the fine for even sharing access is so, the penalty for sharing access is so low, but let alone basically giving access to a home to a near complete stranger really sort of, um, you know, bothered me on a, on a different level as well. Well, then I'll so what, uh, recommend we raise the fine to the maximum, $2,500. Joe, were you saying something? No, I just, <laughs> I was thinking, I, I don't know, about $2,500. I was thinking double to 1000 I can live with that. Could we go to $1,500? I, I really was going to, I had $1,500 in my Head, but if we want to move ahead with a thousand, I'm also okay with that. Renee, what are your thoughts? I'd agree with Graham <laughs> on the fifteen hundred. I third. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's do a mo. Let's let's get a motion on the table. <laughs> uh, motion um, to accept uh, staff's recommendations with the uh, only amendment being that the fine would be increased to $1,500. We have a second. 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 Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes with the amendment of the fee. Complaint matter J is complaint number 2023-1096. The complainant, who was the listing broker of the subject property, alleges that the respondent was practicing real estate with an inactive license at the time of the transaction, which eventually terminated. The investigation also found that the respondent conducted two other transactions while the respondent's license was inactive. Possible violations include 1210-204, errors and omissions insurance required, 1210-217-1Q, unworthy and competent practice, 1210-217-1M, violation of any commission rule or part four, rule 6.20, transaction file requirements, and rule 6.26, actions while license suspended, revoke, expired, or inactive. Disciplinary re recommendations include public censure, a final agency order, a fine of $1,500, coursework in contracts, and coursework in legal issues. And Investigator Gabardi can answer any questions. Great. Any discussion on this one? I'd like to see us consider increasing the fine to at least $4,500, just because we've got someone here who seems to repeatedly try to practice real estate without an active license. That's concerning to me since it's a pattern? I agree. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I was struggling with this because I, I was wondering if instead of increasing the fine, I was wondering if there's some sort of increased oversight we could give or a probation, um, probationary period, um, you know, because I'm wondering if it's the fine or if she, this respondent just needs you know, uh, uh, to be, you know, watched a little bit closer by their employing broker. Graham, I agree with that. Um, that was my main concern was, was there proper supervision? I know she was outside of the um, supervisory period, but I almost feel like she needed a little bit more guidance, um, which wasn't really provided. And I guess, and I mean that now that she's back in active status, right? Um, Cause I see that her license status or the respondent's license status is now active. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of where my head was on if we're gonna increase something, I think oversight. 
So, or is there more coursework? Is there another round of coursework that might be appropriate here? Um, I I don't I don't see coursework as fixing the issue. Um, honestly, I mean, people take the coursework and unless they're unless they're committed to changing how they're practicing or cognizant of that, the classes aren't going to change how they do business. So um, what does that asking the commission, uh, you know, Marsha or someone, what does that look like being that they have, they're already an associate broker. Um, if we ask for, um, we can't do a downgrade. So what, what does that look like asking for supervision, higher supervision? So you can still have a period of time where they're subjected to a high level of supervision like they would be if they were a brand new broker. Um, and then when Penny goes to resolve that case, Penny would be getting verification from the supervisor that they agree to provide that level of supervision. Because it's kind of concerning, as has been mentioned, that, um, you know, this, this brokerage didn't even have checks and balances that this person did not have errors and omissions or whatever that reason is and still allowed those files to go through yeah. um, without them being in place. So that concerns me. Where are their checks and balances for their brokers? So I mean, Joe and Graham, I, I wanted to respond. Uh, I considered at first, you know, maybe this person just needs, after I read the report, maybe they would benefit from um, increased intensity on supervision. But at the end of the day, where I came out was when you're a licensed professional, I got to believe you know when your license is active and when it isn't. And I just, I, it's hard for me to believe that someone's license would expire and they just didn't realize it. And since this was a pattern with this person, that's why I came out on the side of we just need to increase the fine because I don't know what else will get the message across. But that's where I came out. Yeah. And I agree. Ultimately, it's the broker, your responsibility, right, to make sure you have the insurance, you know, insurance. Um, but maybe there's both. I mean, the, the they are with a different brokerage now. So I would be OK of having them have a being supervised um going back to being supervised high level of supervision that's what i'm trying to say yeah i agree renee what are your thoughts so the problem with e and o is that you can't say oh i forgot it's not like you don't get notification after notification after notification etc it just continues so the fact that you are licensed, you know you need this, you need to do this every year, it's nothing new, you know this and you didn't do it, um, that's what's concerning. It's not, oh, it's not my responsibility, it's my broker's responsibility. No, it's your responsibility. You, you know, you get the notifications and it's not one or two and they come for months. So to say... It's not a mistake. It's not, I forgot. It's not an error. It is a blatant disregard for getting it. And it's something that is required in order to keep your license active. I do have a, a question about that. I noticed that the respondents switched brokerages. Was there a period of time, do we know, if that respondent was getting e and insurance through their office, through paying office dues or anything like that. And that's maybe what caused the lapse in e and insurance, or if we could have maybe some background on that might be helpful. Or is, or is this respondent now getting like, are they getting it themselves or are they getting it through the brokerage um, again by, you know, through some sort of office dues or not? I can't speak to the notifications with her current brokerage firm, but with regard to the division of real estate providing notification and the insurance, the E&O insurance companies 
themselves providing information to the brokers, it's my understanding that they're notified months in advance that this is coming up and they're required to do it. And again, they, this is something that occurs every single year. So it's, it's not something, it's not something that's a surprise to them, but in speaking with the employing broker of the brokerage firm that she was at, she did state that that particular employing broker did state that um, they do have um, checks and balances, if you will, in place with regard to you know insurance and their brokers and who needs to do what and when. All right. Thank you. So I think we're all kind of in agreement about higher supervision, right? A higher level of supervision. Um. Is there any discussion um, on raising the fine or are we okay with keeping the fine as is? I'll, I'll compromise at doubling the fine, 3,000 and, and then increase supervision. I, I can live with that. Anybody else on the fine? Yeah, I mean, I would be okay with doubling, but not, you know, tripling the fine, I think with some increased, um, with some increased oversight. So. All right, then may I get a motion? Motion to accept uh, accept staff recommendations uh, with the amendment of a fine of $3,000 and uh, increased supervision. I apologize. What's the right terminology there? High level of supervision. Okay, high level of supervision. Or yeah. we're going to need to or, give a time frame. Yeah, I was going to say, do we need a time frame? Two, two like years. Two years, yeah. So, Josh, your motion um, has two a high years, level two years of high high level supervision and a three thousand dollar fine. All other uh, staff recommendations as submitted. Any? Um, do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Complaint matter K is 2023-1876. The complainant, who was the buyer of the property listed by the respondent, alleged that it was not properly disclosed that the property contained asbestos levels above the allowable standards. Possible violations are 1210-217-1Q, unworthy and competent practice, and disciplinary recommendations are diversion and a fine of $1,000. And investigator Geske can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Any discussion? I wanted to ask the commission to uh, consider increasing the fine on this one to the max of $2,500 simply because I understand that non disclosures can often happen accidentally, but after reading the report, this was an intentional non-disclosure. That was, that's my read on the report anyway. And it was intentional about something that's pretty serious. So I'd like to ask that we consider increasing the fine to 2,500. I think the fine is 7,500 on there. I think that is the max fine. No. I think we're already seeking max. No, fine's only a thousand. That's the next one, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Oops. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, it, the selling agent said that the docs had been uploaded to CTME, and then later found out the docs were not. 
but the docs that supposedly were uploaded contain the information about the asbestos. I, I don't know where that leaves us. It, you know, thought they were done. It wasn't done. But then the buyers did their own test as well. So not sure where that leaves it. If they did their own test, wouldn't they have found out the same information? And the buyers did not do a test. They did not. I thought they did do their own test. Was, wasn't no. it the relocation company yes. did test, but it was only yes, provided sir. to the seller? Yes, sir. Right. I, I give some responsibility to the buyer's agent, actually, because they did not try to obtain the actual report. But that's neither here nor there. But um, I... I I mean, I don't know in this case of whether or not. Actually, I would agree to raising the fine. The, 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 I think the problem was that the seller's property disclosure says no on the asbestos containing it, insulation. I think that was the big thing is that it said no, and it shouldn't have said no. Agreed. And then I think the other thing that concerned me is that there was a text message that was sent um, that said, we're good to go on asbestos. And I would beg to differ. Yep. So, Josh, you're looking for the max fine of twenty five hundred. Yes, Madam Chair. All right. Do we? Um, do you want to make a motion? Well, I, I I have a something I'd like to jump in on here about um, increasing as well. I'm trying to get back. I just wanted to read over the um, report really quickly again. Um, is there a reason we're not seeking like a public censure or final agency order here? Um, just because non-disclosure, I, I think, is is pretty serious, and it does look like there was a you know intent to actually hide something here. Um, so I'm wondering if you know, we could sort of, it, I sort of feel like this is sort of not necessarily a slap on the wrist, but I do think even increasing the fine is, is probably not, um, you know, right here. If you want to go there, Graham, I can totally get behind that. Absolutely. Um, how about uh, anybody else? I mean, what are your, what are our thoughts on this? I don't know. The other thing is the, the the buyer did agree to monetary credit for inspection items. So there's because some of those inspection items dealt with the asbestos and they did get a big credit for it. So well, you know, on the Sorry, but I mean, I guess we hear from someone on the commission about, um, you know, in the past, if we've gone, you know, in a, in a similar situation or not, you, you know, not the same set of facts, but, you know, with the same sort of, um, you know, failure to disclose, um, is this sort of, you know, entirely in line with what we've done before? Or is there, have we gone up in the past and um, what did that look like? I think we saw this as being a little bit different because it didn't seem like the respondent read the report thoroughly and didn't get to the page where it left, where it, it noted the levels. Um, I don't, I don't think they read past the first page. Um, I did, we didn't uh, necessarily see it as being intentional, but it could okay. be seen either way. Yeah, well, I guess that, that clarifies the question for me. Maybe if it's not intentional, then I'm, Okay, if we're not seeing it as intentional, then maybe I maybe misread. So, um, well, I definitely think um, looking at this, this is this is an ER license, right? Someone who should be reading through all that. So, um, I agree also with the higher fine because you you, you that is your responsibility, and you also supervise seven people. Mm -hmm. um, 
you should be looking at every document thoroughly. Um, so I'm okay with the higher fine. Could we do an FAO and a higher fine? I, I would get behind that. And Madam Chair, what were you sort of thinking as a um, an increased fine amount? Um, I think we should go at least double. Okay. Um, I'm on the fence about an FAO. Um, Renee, Joe, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm on the fence as well. You bring up a very valid point. It is an employing broker. Uh, so yes, I agree with the fine should be increased. FAO, I, and then I'm just factoring in no prior steps. What didn't seem intentional. Um, but then factoring in the previous cases we've reviewed with similar non-disclosure, I, I don't know that right now. I'm, I'm okay to go with that in FAO. Um, I just wanted to see what everyone else, you know, kind of thought on that. Um, I'm not wedded to the idea of doing one. If we want to just double the fine, I'm okay with that as well. So why don't we do the max fine of 2,500 and no FAO? I'd agree with that. Okay. All right. Let's get a motion. Um, in Commission Matter K, I move that we um, the display accept staff's recommendations of a diversion, um, but changing the fine to $2,500. Second. Thank you, Josh. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Your next item is investigative matter L. This is audit number X2023-50. The respondent signed a stipulation and final agency order in November 2021 as a result of 2018 division audit. The terms of stipulation involved a fine, suspended license until compliant through reconciliation records were provided, 18-month license downgrade, two follow-up audits, and continuing education. Division oversight led to the respondent downgrading her license prior to submitting the required compliant three of reconciliations. Pursuant to the stipulation, the division initiated the first post suspension audit. While the respondent was unable to provide compliant reconciliations during the term of her suspended license, the division was able to eventually verify that the property management funds were transferred to a new brokerage that the respondent's husband and respondent's mother retained ownership interest in. Possible violations include 12-10-2171G, Failure to timely place deposit funds, 12-10-2171M, violation of any commission rule, part four, including a STIP violation, rules 5.14, record keeping requirements, rule 5.21, production of documents and records, uh, recommended disciplinary action includes a final agency order, public censure, revocation, and a fine of $7,500. And investigator, auditor, Jay McLean and myself are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any discussion? I'd like to make a motion to accept uh, staff recommendations as submitted. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. 
Right. And these next two are the counterparts to investigative matter L. So your next item is investigative matter M. This is audit number X2023-51. The respondent was the owner and employing broker of a now defunct brokerage. He signed an agreement in March 2022, transferring the property management to another brokerage he owns. The respondent did not transfer the security deposit funds to the new brokerage until July 2023 and did not notify clients of the brokerage change until December 2023. The notification of the brokerage change came in the form of a mass email that was sent to clients indicating that the property management had shifted to a new firm with a new broker, but with the same support staff that they always had. The respondent is active, actively involved with the new brokerage, brokerage's activities. Additionally, he owns and is the employing broker of another brokerage that only conducts sales transactions. The reconciliations of both brokerages he owns are non-compliant. It also appears that the respondent has not disclosed the affiliated business arrangement between the sales brokerage firm and the property management brokerage firm. Possible violations include 12-10-2171G, failure to timely Place deposit funds, 12-10-2171M, violation of any commission rule, 12-10-2171W, dishonest dealing, rule 5.7, time deposits. You froze, Eddie. Technology is great till it doesn't work. <laughs> we all went, all of our heads went up at one time. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't just us. Yeah. <laughs> He's pulling a Mitch McConnell. Oh. <laughs> it's oh kind of God. jarring. Sorry, I couldn't resist. I had to. <laughs> it's my last meeting, okay? <laughs> all Should right. We... Should we just read the rest of it? <laughs> or... Where did he leave off? I was. He was on the rules section that had been. Yeah, his the last rule read was five point seven. Yeah, and I can just read the rest. Unless Jay, do you have it in front of you? Do you want to take I, over, Freddie? I do not have it in front of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, fact check me. Um, additional violations include Rule five point eight, transfer of security deposits. Rule five point one four, record keeping requirements. Rule five point two two, employing or independent broker responsible for firm's compliance. Uh, rule six point three, employing broker responsibility. Um, Disciplinary recommendations include diversion, a fine of $3,000, coursework in brokerage relationship, uh, brokerage administration, ethics, and property management, and a follow-up audit within three months. All right. Eddie, are you back? <laughs> Jay is still here to answer your question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Anybody have any questions? So on, on this case, the license was also inactive for a period of time due to E&O insurance. And this is the person who is the head of the brokerage and the PM. How can you, you can't run that with an inactive license? We still have issues with I, balance, I, with three way. We have issues with forms. I think the fine should be increased. I know we've got tons of coursework, but there are. A lot of problems on this one. On um, this particular one, uh, the employing broker, that license was not inactive. It's the next one that the um, employing broker, his license was inactive for a period of time in the beginning of January, 2023. Right, but I thought he was the one who took over from the previous one. So he now is the new broker for the property management. And he would have had an inactive license and have been running a property management company with an inactive license. This particular one, um, audit 2023-51, he, uh, this particular employing broker took over for the sales brokerage that the prior uh, employing broker um, had left. Okay, I thought he was also doing the PM. Who's doing no, the PM? That is the next one, which is audit 2023-65. <laughs> <laughs> I 
they are all related. It is right. very confusing. Um, okay, the, so that's all right. So, Renee, those those clarifications, uh, notwithstanding, I agree with you that the fine should be increased. But I also wanted to ask the commission if we should consider an, at least an FAO. I I don't think so because. I, I think we need to give them a little bit of latitude. They just took on this brokerage and it was already messed up. So they're having to fix these items, which is why they're doing a follow-up audit in three months, right? Okay, but, but they're all the same people, basically. So I don't think we should cut slack because someone just took over. They're <laughs> related, et cetera. I, I don't. I don't think that raises to an FAO though. Maybe a higher fine, but an FAO, I think we need to give them an opportunity to fix those before we, we raise it to an FAO. Hello, commissioners. My apologies. My internet dropped off. Hi, Eddie. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm back. Um, I don't know. Gr Graham, Joe, what, what are your thoughts on this case? Yeah, I mean, I, if I could just comment, you know, I don't, in this case, I, I want to sort of agree with Madam Chair here on not needing to raise it to an FAO. And, you know, again, I look at this and say, you know, a diversion of five to 3,000, you know, coursework, you know, four rounds of coursework and a follow-up audit, I don't really feel is sort of letting someone off easy in this situation, right? I mean, that's a lot of time, um, a lot of time in, in coursework and a lot of time, you know, back in dealing, you know, with our, um, Great Commission staff, um, so I don't really feel like this is necessarily letting them off easy, but I would be okay with maybe bumping the fight up to four thousand dollars. Graham, my concern wasn't so much about whether or not we're letting them off easy. It was that I just wanted to give the public a, an opportunity to find out that all this happened. That was mm -hmm. my interest in the FAO. Well, but that can also happen after the follow-up audit if they have not corrected their issues. That Fair I mean, enough. the follow-up follow yeah. um, audit is in three months. So um, it's not like staff is giving them a year to do this. It's three months to yeah. get compliant. So um, I think if, if that's not enough time for them to do that, then that's when we elevate it um, to harsher, harsher. So Agreed. Joe, thoughts? <laughs> Thought you were going to pick on me. Um, uh, no, I, in your last meeting, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> no, I totally agree with you, Anna Graham. I think it does seem like that these are all like the same respondent, but this is a we have to treat each respondent separately. No prior steps. Um, taking on you know everything. Uh, they are getting s some sort of disciplinary action, but. Um, I don't think your board's an FAO at this time. Your thoughts on a higher fine? Um, I mean, I wouldn't go more than 5,000. I know there are three violations, but. I think Graham, you suggested four. I just don't see it rising to the occasion of max fine for each one. I just don't. Yeah. 5,000 is what I had in mind for what it's worth. All right. Renee, any other thoughts? I could go with either the four or the five. All right. Um, all right, let's have a motion. A motion. All right. <laughs> A motion to accept 
staff recommendations with an amendment to the fine to increased to 5,000. Second. All right, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Correct me if I'm wrong, we are on investigative matter and now, is that correct? Yes, yeah. we, we are. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Great timing for Xfinity to drop off. <laughs> um, okay, next uh, item for your agenda is investigative matter N. This is audit number X2023-65. The respondent is the employing broker for a brokerage open in July 2022 to engage solely in the property management book of business transfer from another brokerage. The initial funds for money belonging to others were not transferred to the respondent's brokerage until November 2022. Security deposits were not transferred until July of 2023. The respondent did not notify the clients that their property management business had changed brokerages. The respondent was not a signatory on the property management bank accounts until July and October 2023, respectively. <laughs> Additionally, the respondent's bank accounts and three records reconciliations appear non-compliant. Lastly, the respondent's brokerage firm shares office staff and telephone number with another brokerage that has common ownership. It does not appear that affiliated business arrangement between the respondent's property management brokerage firm and related sales brokerage has been disclosed. Possible violations include 12-10-2171G, failure to timely place deposit funds, 12-10-2171H, failure to account for funds received, 12-10-2171M, violation of any commission rule, 12-10-2171Q, unworthy and competent practice. Rules 5.2, money belonging to others must be deposited in trust or escrow. Rule 5.6, trust or escrow funds must be available immediately. Rule 5.22, employing or independent broker responsible for firm's compliance with Chapter 5 rules. Rule 6.2, competency must possess experience, training, and knowledge. Rule 6.10, advertising. Recommended disciplinary action includes diversion, a fine of $5,000, a 24-month probation, coursework and brokerage relationships, coursework and brokerage administration, coursework and contracts, coursework and ethics, coursework and trust accounts, coursework and property management, and a follow-up audit within three months. And again, myself and auditor Jay McLean can answer any questions you may have. Sorry, on the last one, I was looking at N instead of M. So that's why, that's why it didn't make sense, Jay. <laughs> So uh, this one is where the license was enacted for a period of time. This person also has no experience in property management and that ex everything, you know, not fiduciary accounts, wrong headings, didn't balance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all sorts of accounting issues. And, and because he's now in charge of this, there, there's no one overseeing this person either. And this person has no experience in property management. So it's kind of a mess. <laughs> that, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my question is, you know, if they took all this property management book and they're on probation. Yeah. Who's, who's going to be supervising that book of business? Yeah. There's no one to oversee this person. <laughs> sure. So I, I think the probation is to be used in a, in a manner if there's, you know, any complaints or additional license law violations during that term uh, where you can then, the commission can then act on that. Uh, I don't think it's supposed to restrict them from being able to perform property management. I have the same challenge with this one that I have with the last one. Um, I'm okay with the fine on this one, but um, do we want to consider an FAO? I mean, do we really want to keep the public from finding out that all this happened? Well, again, they're doing an audit in three months. So, um, I think that we need, again, we need to, like, we can't, if we're going to be doing a follow-up audit, we can't be giving them the max discipline of things because then what, in three months, what are we going to give them? I mean, 
if 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 they don't comply, if they're not in compliance. So I understand what you're saying. Um, but again, with the audit being in three months, I think that that at that time, if that's something that is is then deemed necessary, we can then do it at that time. Um, but that's me. No, and I, I agree with you on that as well. And, you know, I don't think this is about withholding information from the public or anything like that. I just, I think this is just, you know, a course of things in the way, you know, it just kind of should, I, you know, in my opinion should work that, you know, we do have some things left over, you know, for, um, you know, the follow-up audit. Um, and, you know, it, it might rise to the FAO and public censure, right? But right now, I just don't think I'm there with what we have now. I think, unfortunately, our biggest, one of our biggest struggles with property management is there's, there's not, um, being that it's not like a broker's license, right? Um, that they're not required to take the education that I think people get into it thinking one thing and not understanding fully um, what is required of them. So I think we need to sometimes offer that. And I don't think there this person like an FAO would be warning the public, but I don't think this is, I don't think they're trying to just, dis- to deceive the public at this time. I don't think that's what we're looking at. I think it's someone who needs to get their stuff together, their systems together. Um, and I think that follow-up audit is allowing them to do that properly. And um, I think I read that they do have um, an attorney, right. That represents them. And my understanding is, um, you know, they will be getting counsel on that side. Um, hopefully, on how to get those things set up. So um, I just I just don't think FAO right now is is where we need to be. If if I may interrupt, they had an attorney mm. for a three month period, but they um, during the last half of the audit, they they no longer had okay. attorney representation. All right. And then Michelle, you brought up something about there we go, Marsha. There's something for the next meeting. We we need to have a property management license. <laughs> oh, girl, we've been talking about that for years. <laughs> and my understanding is it's not a division of real estate thing. It's it's a legal matter, correct, Marsha? It's a like a state, like a statutory thing. Statutory thing that we can't just Im- implement here. Right. <laughs> Your program goes under sunset review starting next year, though. So if somebody <laughs> wants to make that recommendation again and see if the legislature will go along, with them, that's definitely one avenue that they can pursue. Send all the case files over. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we need it. Um, <clears throat> as long as I've been on the, the commission, Renee, it has been a, a, a subject. So it, it's been a while. Um, yeah, it may always seem to be our most complicated. Mm-hmm cases um just because you know they are so different in practice than what most people on this commission do um Mm -hmm. in my opinion so i think that having something with like a stricter set of rules i think would bring you know greater clarity for everybody right and going back to what i had asked i believe it was um betsy earlier is that during the audit they do give them um references they do give them some you know, places to go get this information. So I think the audit in three months will give us a very good indication of whether or not they're trying to be in compliance or in compliance. As we've seen in previous cases, people can do it. Um, They can get in compliance. So I think we need to offer that um, ability to them to do so. Um, So So based on that, based on that, we should, I, I motion to accept staff recommendation. All right. Thank you, Renee. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Um, Commission matter O is complaint number 2023-2533. On December 15th, 2023, the respondent pled guilty to assault 
two, strangulation, class four felony. Respondent received a deferred judgment and sentence and is serving two years probation. The conviction was reported um, to the Division of Real Estate within the required 30 days post-conviction. Um, the vi possible violation is 1210-217-1N. Uh, disciplinary recommendation is diversion, a fine of $250, and um, probation that is concurrent with criminal probation. And uh, investigator coach is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none? I move. Oh, Go sorry. Ahead. I say I move to accept staff recommendation. Second. Thank you. Any any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. Investigative matter P is complaint number 2023-2421. On November 11th, 2023, the respondent pled guilty to sexual contact, no co consent, a class one misdemeanor. The respondent received a deferred judgment and sentence and is currently serving 24 months probation. The charge resulted from an incident in which uh, the respondent was accused of touching two women sexually without their consent when he was intoxicated. Possible violations are 1210-217-1N. Disciplinary recommendation is diversion, um, a fine of 250, and probation that is current with criminal probation. Again, investigator Coates is here to answer any questions. Thank you. I had one question. Um, do the, it says the license status of this respondent is expired? Is it still expired? And have there been any efforts to uh, renew? Um, it is still expired. Um, as far as efforts to renew, I don't believe that I saw any applications. Um, so because it's still in the reinstatement period is why we're bringing it to you um, because they could reinstate at um, any time. Okay. All right, we have a motion. In commission matter P, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Graham. No, um, in commission matter P, I move to accept staff's recommendations. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Commission matter Q is complaint number 2023-2149. On July 19th, 2022, the respondent pled guilty to assault three, a class one misdemeanor, and was sentenced to 18 months probation on a deferred judgment and sentence in Arapahoe County. The respondent failed to notify the Division of Real Estate of this plea. On October 20th, 2023, in a separate criminal case, the respondent pled guilty to assault three, a class one misdemeanor, and was sentenced to two years probation. This conviction revoked the previous deferred judgment and sentence um, in Arapahoe County, and the respondent was sentenced to probation, running concurrent with the previous Adams County case. The respondent failed to notify the Division of Real Estate of this criminal conviction. The respondent did not provide the requested response and documents by the deadline given on the notification letter. Final notice to comply was sent on January 16th, 2024, with a deadline of January uh, 26. The respondent failed to respond to that deadline. On February 13th, 2024, the respondent made contact with the division and sent in a written explanation for both convictions. None of the other requi requested documentation was provided by the respondent. Possible violations are 1210-217-1N, 1210-217-1P, 1210-217-1M, Rule 6.23 and Rule 6.25. Disciplinary recommendation is a diversion of fine of $1,500 and probation that is concurrent with criminal probation. Any discussion? Well, I wanted to ask the commission what you thought about maybe some stiffer discipline because we have a, a repeat criminal offender whose offenses are all recent 
who failed to notify the division of any of their criminal offenses and who hasn't been compliant with the division's uh, document requests. And so I wonder if the disciplinary recommendations are not harsh enough. So in what, what are you thinking? I don't know. I wanted to see what all of you thought. Well, what's going to happen is once we, once we agree on discipline, then they will send it to him. And if he doesn't comply, then it'll come back in front of us. We're not complying. And at that time we can impose probably what you're looking for is something of a harsher discipline for not responding. Um, Because it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't rise to an FAO or a revocation or a public censure. So unless you're adding coursework or a fine in addition, or a higher fine, I don't know what else we would be looking at. I think that's why the fine is already so high. Yeah, 1500 I think what makes me nervous is that this person still has an active license. Well, and if they, but if they don't respond or they don't, you know, um, so that's why I'm asking you, what do you, what are you looking for? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't raise to an FAO. And we, there's not, there's not justification to revoke. So. I, I don't think I was suggesting that. I think that um, maybe increasing the fine. Well, both of these, I, both of these um, court cases are misdemeanors. Um, and so the violations and the rules, the fine is pretty, in alignment with that, if not higher than we usually do, probably because he's not responding. Okay. Where I understand your concern, um, the cases were misdemeanors. They were not real estate related. Um, I, I totally get it. I just don't know if we have justification to do anything different than what we're already doing. Um, I don't know. Renee, Joe, Graham, any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't see anything off with the disciplinary recommendations and I would just be inclined to accept them as they are. Yes. All right. Um, can we get a motion? I motion to accept staff recommendation. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Sorry. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Motion passes with four votes. All right. Investigative matter F is complaint number 2023-95. Complainant explained that the respondent listed complainant's business for sale which included a lease assignment. Complainant alleged that after respondent showed the business to a friend, it seemed that respondent was solely representing the buyer. Complainant alleged that respondent discouraged other buyers from viewing the property. Finally, complainant stated that she later found out that the respondent was inactive while he was engaged in the transaction. Additional potential violations uncovered during the investigation are that respondent provided the division with an altered ENO certificate and correspondence, failed to ensure he had an active license, failed to provide written disclosure of his brokerage relationships or lack thereof to the parties of the transactions, used a non-commission and non-attorney drafted document, failed to disclose certain documents he drafted were not commission approved forms, failed to enter into a written lease listing agreement with the landlord of the subject property, and failed to maintain a complete transaction file, including fully executed documents. Possible violations are 1210-217-1M, 1210-408-2, 1210-217-1Q, 
1210-217-1W, 1210-403-4C, Rule 6.5, 6.7, 6.14C, and 7.1. The disciplinary recommendation includes no agency order, public censure, revocation, and a fine of $20,000. Any discussion? I'll make a motion to accept uh, staff recommendations as submitted. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. Um, matter. E is complaint number 2023-49. Complainant explained that respondent listed complainant's business for sale, which included a lease assignment. Complainant alleged that after respondent's co-respondent showed the business to a friend, it seemed that respondent was solely representing the buyers. The complainant alleged that respondent discouraged other buyers from viewing the property. Complainant explained that respondent stated that two buyers had viewed the property and business when they had not. Additional potential violations uncovered during the investigation or that the respondent failed to provide a high level of supervision to his co-respondent, failed to ensure that his co-respondent held an active license, failed to provide written disclosure of his brokerage relationships or lack thereof to the parties of the transaction, engaged in dual agency, Used a non commission and non attorney drafted document, failed to ensure that the LOIs his correspondent drafted included the disclosure that they were not commission approved forms, failed to ensure his correspondent entered into a written lease listing agreement with the landlord of the subject property, failed to maintain a complete transaction file included fully, including fully executed documents and settlement statements, and failed to have a written brokerage relationship policy. Possible violations are 1210-217-1M, 1210-217-1R, 1210-403-4C, 1210-217-1Q, 1210-217-1W, 1210-4082, and Rule 6.3D, 6.4, 6.5, 6.7, 6.7, 6.14C and 7.1. A disciplinary recommendation is a final agency order, public censure, revocation, and a fine of $27,500. And investigator Denise Wright is there to answer any questions. All right. Any discussion? Make I move to accept staff recommendations as submitted. A second. Second. Thank you, Renee. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Um, complaint matter T, or I'm sorry, complaint matter U is complaint number 2022-2122. The Division of Real Estate received a complaint which alleged that the respondent failed to disclose all of the repairs done on a home, which he himself owned and sold to the complainant. The complainant was represented by a buyer's broker and received documentation about repairs made as part of the insurance claim. The complainant saw the property while some repairs were still being completed. Possible violations are 1210-4043A, 1210-217-1M, um, and the re recommendation on this one is um, a dismissal. Um, we just wanted to bring it to the commission to review, um, considering that there were some oddities about this one, uh, especially in that last invoice. And Investigator Hardy is here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I think it should be something more than a dismissal, maybe a letter of concern, because there were some items that should have been on the seller's property disclosure that were not. So I don't think it should be a total dismissal. Okay. I agree with that. 
Try to go along with that too. Right. Renee, would you like to make the motion? Um, I motion that in commission matter you that we do a letter of concern, not a dismissal. And and I'm sorry, just to clarify, so um, a letter of concern is so we dismiss the case, but then we will write a letter of concern to the respondent saying. You know, we did uncover these issues. However, we've decided to dismiss. Um, the other option is um, an LOA, and that is more a letter of, just blew out of my mind what that A stands for. Um, but that will actually, that's Dishing. a little bit. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I think it's admonition, letter of admonition. Thank you. It was in my head five seconds before. Um, letter of admonition, which is more a little more formal. Um, it's still a diversion, so or uh, it still is not anything public, but it does show um, something a little bit more formal. So I just wanted to clarify. Okay, I yes, I, I guess I would have would change that then to um, and matter you to do an LOA, not an LOC, an LOA. Okay. Um, and that comes with a diversion, correct, Sarah? Or is that yeah. a dismissal? Um, it, no, it, it's neither. It, it's a letter of admonition, and he okay. can take it to hearing if he disagrees with it. We okay. don't issue very many of these because of that reason. It basically says that because you didn't, that you chose not to take formal action, um, but you're going to issue the letter of admonition, and then he's got a right to request a hearing for that. So it would have to, would that come back then? Uh, if you took it to hearing, it would. Oh, if he took it. But if he accepts it, it's fine. It just sits in his file. Okay. Correct. Yeah, if they exercise the right to appeal the LOA, it comes to my office, not back to you. So it's, it, the process is a little different than what you see with other types of discipline. Okay. All right. So on the table, we have a motion for an LOA. Do we have a second? Okay, hold on. <laughs> so, the, so let, can we get a little more clarity on the LOA versus the LOC then? LOC is just a, a, a letter of concern and it's dismissed. The LOA is, you said it's a stronger letter, but what else is in there? It said, well, essentially the language says that the commission didn't choose to pursue formal action. However, they had concern but it's not a dismissal. And it's also kind of debatable with the different programs, whether it's releasable under a quorum, mm. whereas a dismissal is not. And Renee, to further clarify, Marsha's right. Um, the letter of concern is not a separate right that the commission has. It's something that attaches to a dismissal. So you don't just send a letter of concern, you would send a dismissal with a letter of concern. The recommendation was just a dismissal, no letter. You can opt to dismiss it and also send the letter to the respondent. That would, I, I believe, Marcia, correct me if I'm wrong, that stays in the respondent's file. So if they were to come back before the commission, you would see that they have, um, that this was an action that was taken in the past. We don't retain it for forever like we do other disciplinary documents, it would be, it would be part of our document disposition schedule at which with dismissals, we only retain those for a year. So if 10 years from now, something came up, we could cite that there was an LOA or an LOC that was part of the dismissal, but we couldn't give you any more details on that. Okay, so what's the recommendation? <laughs> The original okay. recommendation was for a flat out dismissal. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I'm fine with the letter of concern. Again, I'm fine with the Thank letter you. of concern, but Renee, are you okay with the letter of concern? That's fine. So we'll go back to in matter you <laughs> dismissal with letter of concern. All right. Second. Any further discussion? All votes in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
motion passes. Okay. Um, matter V is complaint number 2023-2422. On November 11th, 2023, the respondent pled guilty to theft, felony four. The respondent was ordered to serve public service, probation, and pay restitution. The respondent failed to notify the Colorado Real Estate Commission um, and did not respond to the investigation. Uh, possible violations are 121271 one n 121217-1M, 121217-1P, Rule 6.23, and Rule 6.25. Um, the disciplinary recommendation is final agency order, public censure, um, revocation, a fine of $10,000. Um, and investigator uh, Levy is here to answer any questions you may have. And just a note, um, this um, respondent is also expired at this time, but within the reinstatement period. Any discussion? Have there been any efforts to renew the license that we're aware of? I don't believe so, not that we're aware of. Okay. All right, may we get a motion? I move to approve uh, staff recommendations as submitted. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, your next complaint matter is investigative matter W. This is complaint number 2023-609. On March 30, 2023, the complainant filed complaint number 2023-609 against the respondent, stating that the respondent failed to remit monthly rental proceeds on the two properties she managed on his behalf from August 2022 to March 2023 and failed to provide owner statements. The investigation noted that the respondent provided figures in the owner statements and owner disbursement reports that did not reconcile the actual payments made to the complainant's IRA account. The complainant appears to be owed an additional $15,834.40 in rental proceeds. From January 2023 to August 2023, it appears the respondent made personal purchases directly from the rental account in an amount totaling approximately $111,194.13. Additionally, on August 15, 2023, a $95,000 transfer withdrawal was made from the rental account and deposited into the respondent's personal account. Combined total of $473,476.13 was transferred from the rental account into the respondent's personal account, which includes the apparent personal expenses of the respondent. From January 2023 to November 2023, the account holding security deposits had a total balance ranging from $64,494.62 to $0 at account closeout. The respondent failed to provide three reconciliation reports in monthly journals or ledgers for accounts holding funds of others, including the security deposit account. The respondent failed to provide management fee reports to detail what she was owed each month in management fees. The accounts used by the respondent regularly appear to commingle trust funds with broker funds, as well as appear to be used for the respondent's personal expenses. Possible violations include 12-10-2171H, failure to account for funds received, 12-10-2171I, converting, diverting, commingling funds, 12-10-2171M, violation of any commission rule, 12-10-2171Q, unworthy and competent practice, 12-10-2171W, dishonest dealing, Rule 5.2, money belonging to others must be deposited in trust or escrow. Rule 5.9, diversion and conversion prohibited. Rule 5.10, commingling prohibited. Rule 5.14, record keeping requirements. Rule 5.15, maintenance, production and reports to beneficiaries. Rule 5.21, failure to produce documents and records. And Rule 6.25, failure to submit written response to the complaint. Recommended disciplinary action includes a final agency order, public censure, revocation, and a fine of $27,500. And investigator Marcy Rivera and myself are here to answer any questions you may have. Great. So will this automatically be referred to the AG's office? I do not know the answer to that question. I think it will go through the regular um, uh, discipline settlement process. I mean, as far as for the the money that is 
missing and things? Do we need to put something on there about refer it to someone or will that go automatically? We are already in the process of that currently, okay. and there okay. are additional open investigations uh, with okay. similar allegations that we are currently trying to um, conclude as well. Okay. All right. And I motion to accept staff recommendation. Second. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We are now on to licensing matters. So licensing matter A is complaint number 2024-174. Uh, On December 22nd, 2021, the applicant pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor harassment strike shove kick. The applicant was sentenced to 18 months probation and a fine of $327.50. The case is closed. On November 12th, 2021, the applicant pleaded guilty to a felony DUI with three plus priors. The applicant was sentenced to 240 days in jail, three years probation, and a fine of $1,882.50 with a current balance of $460. Jail and probation has been completed successfully and the case is closed. On November 12, 2021, the applicant pleaded guilty in a separate case of felony DUI with three plus priors. The applicant was sentenced to 240 days in jail, three years probation, Fine of $5,287.50 with a balance currently of $5,237.50. This case sentencing is concurrent with the both of the above cases. Uh, jail and probation have been completed successfully and the case is closed. Um, as usual, there is no recommendation. This is an application and uh, Investigator Quinton is here to answer any questions. So there are still two balances outstanding, is that correct? Correct. On the second and third conviction? Correct. And this one was odd because there were resumes attached and the resumes said that this person was licensed in Colorado real estate for years, the years listed, they were not. And it also said that they had a current real estate license, which they do not. Um, and this is on the resume that was attached. So I would vote no, based on the information that was provided. I wanted to see what you'd say, Renee, but I, I concur. You know, you're applying for a, a, a license, but yet you're stating you already have one and have had one. I have a problem with that. I want to add, um, my concern was, I just wanted to hear more about how the applicant was dealing with their I guess, substance abuse. Um, that would have been helpful if they could elaborate more on that um especially since you know i felt like the the duis were so more recent all right do we have a motion i move to I deny all right, we'll have to give a reason. Um, Commissioners, I heard in your discussion a lack of truthfulness, honesty, and good moral character. Would that be the reason? Yes. Thank you. With that. I, I, I have a quick question about the resume, um, just because I, I have it pull up in front of me right now. I mean, do we think that there's like a, you know, she put education license in Colorado real estate. I mean, was she maybe putting that she took the course in Ohio to be licensed in Colorado real estate? And then like, is she confused, like maybe confused that at the time that maybe taking the course automatically granted her 
uh, real estate license, I guess I just, I'm wondering if we feel like there's actual intent to deceive here on the resume or if there's just a, maybe not quite understanding. The resume says that she has a real estate license from mm -hmm. 124 to present. And that's not correct. She's applying for one. Right. But I'm just, my question is, I'm wondering if it's, you know, if it's an error or it's like a, a willful intent to deceive. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I just. Well, it, in, the, in the top verbiage, it says a newly licensed real estate agent, which is yeah. incorrect. So part of that concern for me would be, even if it's not intended, how easy is that in real estate in general to not intend to do something and mess up a transaction? <laughs> Like we, no, we, I know. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm just I'm wondering, you know, about, you know, I just well, don't, I don't see this as like a willful intent to do that. Personally, I don't. I'm not saying that I am going to disagree with whether or not, um, you know, I'm not inclined to accept the like the you know approve the license. I'm just saying I just I'm not seeing the resume as you know I'm I'm leaving it open to interpretation. That's just all I'm going to say. Because I see some gray area there is whether or not, you know, she meant to say she was licensed or whether or not she took getting the real estate certificate that you, you know, get at the end of your course as a licensure, right? Um, I just remind, remind me if we deny now, she can reapply like, mm -hmm. she is immediately or is there a no. certain. She can yeah. apply tomorrow if she wants to or this afternoon. I'm there's okay. no limitations on when they can reapply once denied. Okay. And just she also has the right to appeal the denial. There we go. To <laughs> I'll send her, a, I, I send out a letter with the licensing decision and it gives them um, a 60 day window to submit to me whether they want to appeal that decision. If we don't hear from them, it remains a denial of record. If we do hear from them, that they're requesting a hearing, then they have that right to, you know, go through the hearing process and appeal the denial. All right. So we had a motion of denial. Um, do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes for denial. Okay, licensing matter B is an application. It's complaint number 2024-424. On August 31st, 1999, the applicant pleaded guilty to a class four felony theft uh, of more than 400, but less than 15,000. On August 25th, 2000, the applicant pleaded guilty to possession of opiates, opium, or narcotic drugs and possession of paraphernalia to grow distribute marijuana. Um, these were both felonies. On August 15th, 2002, the applicant pleaded guilty to a motor vehicle theft um, under 15,000, a class five felony. And on January 12th, 2006, the applicant pleaded guilty to theft of 500 to 15,000, um, attempted theft, a class five felony. Uh, there's no recommendation and investigator Quinton is here to I appreciated that there was a letter from the employing broker about supervision and all the other letters that were submitted and the personal letter as well. So I would vote for an approval on this one. I second that. All right, Renee, you want to make a motion? I motion that we approve the application on licensing matter B. Second. Thank you, Josh. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes for approval. All right. Uh, licensing matter B is complaint number 2024-122. This is a preliminary advisory opinion. On July 21st, 2014, the applicant was convicted of robbery, a class four felony. Uh, in June 2014, the applicant was convicted of theft, a class two misdemeanor. 
On September 26, 2014, the applicant was convicted of theft of 300 to 750, a class two misdemeanor. On November 6, 2015, the applicant was convicted of a controlled substance possession, Schedule 3, 4, or 5, a class one drug misdemeanor. On March 21, 2016, the applicant was convicted of motor vehicle theft, aggravated um, under 1,000, a class one misdemeanor. On September 1, 2016, the applicant was convicted of two class six felonies, vehicular eluding and motor vehicle theft, aggravated. On April 12, 2019, the applicant was convicted of theft of 750 to 2000, a class one misdemeanor. Uh, there are no recommendations and an investigator Quintana can answer any questions. I myself would be leaning toward denial. We've got someone with a repeated criminal history all within the last 10 years, and it all has to do with theft. And uh, if they were to have a license, they would have access to furnished homes um, and other things of value. So I, I can't see my way to approving this application. So I was leaning the other way. Um, I, I do feel like they had a well-written personal statements, personal statement. And, um, you know, with the letters of rec, I just felt like they were, they have been rehabilitated. Um, so I would motion for a positive opinion because I know it's a PAO, so positive opinion on this applicant. Yeah. Sorry. Apologies. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I want to touch on exactly what um, Christopher Chang said. I, you know, I was, I enjoyed, you know, I, I see what uh, you're saying, Josh, but I do see, um, you know, I, the personal statement and, you know, the personal letters of recommendation were, um, they're multiple um, and they were quite thorough. Um, and so I, you know, I do see, um, you know, I, I would be inclined to uh, give a positive opinion here, just given that as well. All right. Do we have a motion? Um, I'll motion for positive opinion. Second. Do we have any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Motion passes for positive opinion with four votes. Okay. Um, licensing matter D is complaint number 2023-2578. This is a preliminary advisory opinion. On March 15th, 2013, the applicant was convicted of four felony counts in the United States District Court, District of Colorado. The applicant was convicted of wire fraud and aiding and abetting, money laundering, bank fraud, and a forfeiture, forfeiture allegation. These convictions were related to a real estate transaction um, or real estate transaction. The applicant served his prison time, has completed probation with uh, early termination in 2023. Uh, the applicant does still owe restitution. Um, in 2013, the Colorado Real Estate Commission revoked the applicant's real estate license. Um, as usual, there is no recommendation, and Investigator Levy is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any discussion or questions? I struggle with this one because the convictions were related to real estate, but then it was more than 10 years ago. So I... I got to be honest, I'm on the fence. There's a history of multiple stipulations and there's a huge amount of restitution and it is all having to do with the real estate industry. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm leaning, Renee, as well as he just got out. The, the um, applicant just got out. There is a huge huge restitution still owed um that is a cause 
for concern um, in dealing with real estate, um, especially how this applicant got in trouble to begin with. And um, for me, I am leaning towards a negative opinion. Um, I am too. Joe, Graham. Um, I'm also sort of leaning towards a negative um, opinion as well. And, um, you know, I think we just would like to see some more time. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do struggle with the amount of restitution that's still, um, you know, out there um, on the books. So, um, yeah, I would be inclined to issue a negative opinion at this time. Well, the, the comment that uh, the quote was that he says he didn't know fraud was going on. I have a problem with that one, too. <laughs> All right. Can we get a motion? Motion to, uh, uh, I guess, motion to issue a negative opinion. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes for negative opinion. Okay, um, licensing matter E is complaint number 2024-123. Uh, this is an application. On December 19th, 2012, the applicant was issued a cease and desist order by the Nebraska Real Estate Commission. The order was based on a Nebraska investigation that showed the applicant had listed two Nebraska properties in a Florida MLS. The Florida MLS shared that information with Realtor.com. As a result of the Nebraska cease and desist, the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation took action on the applicant's Illinois real estate broker license. The applicant was issued a consent order on February 25th, 2014. The applicant is licensed and active in 30 states, inactive in three states, and holds an Ohio law license in good standing. Uh, there's no recommendation and investigator may be serving certain questions. All right, any questions or discussion on this? So I had a tough time with this. Um, I'm assuming a lot, which I don't know if my assumption warrants denying a license. Um, it looks like he wants to practice limited service. Mm -hmm marketing or and knowing how the commission has viewed that in the past uh, that's where i struggle with it all well that was what the problem was in illinois it was failure to pro to, to provide minimum services and yeah we, we would have the same issue here so based on that i would not approved. Can we take that up preemptively, though? I mean, could, or, I mean, I are, are we allowed to consider that preemptively without there actually being any sort of, um, you know, in Colorado, there being a, I guess, just for clarity. Um, so that's kind of what I struggled with. I, I struggle with that as well. You know, the intent to sort of do uh, possibly limited service, but I was just kind of wondering if we we're able to you know, deny that, you know, with that intent, or do we have to wait for them to actually perform limited service for us to take action? The standard for a license decision by the commission is whether the applicant is truthful, honest, of good moral character, and competent to transact business in the public interest. If that helps. Yeah. Is so, there some sort of a restriction that we could uh, attach to this that might assuage the concerns of Joe and Renee? Well, I think he's ish he wants to be an independent. independent. And so we approved, but on the associate level. With an employing broker. Yeah. yeah. And that's within our jurisdiction, correct? How, how do you do that when he lives in another state? 
That's up to him. Yeah. That's up to him. I mean, I don't think we can set parameters. Um, I mean, nothing in our, nothing, I, I don't believe in our statute or law, re license law requires them to live in Colorado. Right. So um, that would be up to him to find an employing broker who is willing to work with him. So we could approve with restriction of being a associate broker with a, with a, I guess you already get two years yeah. of high level of supervision for two years on an associate broker anyway. So. Yeah. Also I think that's where I would be at too, would be, um, you know, accepting the application or approving the application, but as an associate and not as an employee or independent broker. He, he didn't provide any recommendation letters, no personal statement. There was nothing to go on. Right. So if this wouldn't, with the restriction, he would have to prove, you know, his, where he'd be working under here in Colorado before that's approved. Is my, correct? If you want us to physically approve his employing broker beforehand, then you can make that a criteria of issuing the license. Can we say high level of supervision required? Well, well it's already, two years he's supposed to have that. Yeah, it's already required for the first two years of an associate. But if we put it on there, then it makes the employing broker more aware that he needs to make sure. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think I think it require that he's got to disclose his background to his employing broker and his employing broker has to acknowledge accept responsibility for that. The employing broker is already going to be held accountable for a high level of supervision right. for somebody under two years. So if we're going to mandate that, Renee, like if you want that in writing, it's going to be have to be longer than the two years. Like we're requiring three or four years of high level of supervision. If that makes sense. So Marsha, what you're saying is we could actually we could approve him for something, but put something on there that we need the approval letter before a license is issued. Is that what you're saying? Correct. I mean, you would basically be doing a restricted license and the employing broker, depending on what criteria, and Penny can chime in here as well, but I mean, you can set criteria that he's got to disclose his background to his employing broker and his employing broker has to be approved by the commission before he can supervise. So the the standard language that we use in a in a restricted stipulation does um, outline their past whatever the issue is that that may be uh, worthy of denying the license and it it puts it in there and then we do ask for a letter from an employing broker that says you have reviewed that stipulation and you agree to supervise them under those terms if you want him to have a high level of supervision even though a brand new associate broker um, is required to have the two years of high level because in our licensing process, we do count for years served in other jurisdictions. It's probably clear to state it if you specifically want that. So yes. that's kind of what our standard language is. And so for me not to state that would be a little deviation from it. So I'm just putting that out there. That's helpful. All right. Well, I mean, if we if we approve with restriction, the applicant has one or two choices. If they really want to do business in Colorado, they'll follow the rules. If they decide that the all they want to do was limited service, then they'll they'll not they'll not take it. So, um, <clears throat> do we have a motion to approve with? Does anybody want to take a stab at that? Motion to approve the application with we need uh, we need the letter from the employing broker approving him to be an FA underneath him before a license is approved. 
and we need a high level of supervision for two years. Okay, a, thank you, Josh. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes for approval with restrictions as outlined. All right, folks, we have two more items. Um, you want to just power through real quick and- yeah, Madam Chair, if I could, I do need to uh, use the restroom. I'll be <laughs> back. <laughs> Wait, well, let's just take a quick five minute then. Is everybody good okay. with that? Yeah, okay. sorry. Oh, you're good. Be back at 11.15. Uh, All right, it looks like we have everybody back. Great. Um, so now on to ESP matters. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> the first one I have for you is complaint 2022-1. Uh, 
24-547. And um, this complaint is involving improper management of monies belonging to others. Um, it's a sort of an understatement. As you can tell by the list of violations, I've also attached the report for you to review because it was much more complicated than just that. Um, when you reviewed this matter, you voted for a final agency order, a public censure, a $40,000 fine plus the 15% and a revocation of the license. And this individual through their attorney is submitting a counter offer. Their intention is to uh, shut down their property management business and want to focus only on sales transactions. Um, they are asking, uh, or they are saying that they would accept a final agency order, a fine of $15,000, but with the caveat that they would only pay $5,000 and the $10,000 would be stayed pending successful, successful completion of the remaining terms. They would have a license downgrade for three years and then must requalify to get their employing broker level back. Uh, Three-year probation requiring a high level of supervision, an audit to confirm appropriate disbursement of all the trust funds and liabilities that were associated with the property management, a practice restriction with no property management for 10 years, and that they are willing to make admissions to the violations listed above with the exception of asking for no admission to the few that I've listed here. Um, the one thing of note to consider is that they have had two previous stipulation for diversions, so lower level issues, but both of those issues were related to uh, sales as opposed to uh, property management. And like always, when you see these counter offers, you have the option of, uh, through a motion of rejecting, accepting, or providing an alternative settlement direction if you choose to go that way. And I'll do my best to answer your questions. I have a question regarding the audit. So an audit to confirm appropriate uh, disbursement of all trust fund liabilities, that's an audit that they are paying like an audit firm to do and then submit that to you to prove that that has been done. That is not using our resources, correct? Um, I mean, I'd have to pull the letter back up to, I, I, I don't know that it was crystal clear on that, but if that was a road that you wanted to go down, we could make that clear, but it would be their obligation to, you know, show that. There is a, there was a, a lot of issues with the accounting and a lot of um, monies that seem to be misappropriated. So I'm, I think that would be a bit of a complex audit or demonstration, if you will. So it, it, are there companies, there are companies out there that do intensive, I don't know if the word is forensic audits, correct? That would, that they could hire to do that. I don't know if Eddie's still on the meeting here or if there's someone else or Marsha, whether you would have more information on that than I do. I, I can't speak directly to that. Well, they should be a forensic auditor um, rather than placing the burden on our resources. Uh, well, and that, that was kind of what I was thinking. If if we're going to consider, consider, right, this, then I think if that's part of it, that the respondent needs to take on that cost of a forensic audit or whatever that looks like um, to not put the burden on our staff to do that. Um, I think that shows kind of good faith of wanting to get the money back where it goes. Um, and I don't know if Charles Riquet is on right now. He was the investigator of the original complaint. Um, uh, if you have questions for him as well, I don't, I don't know. I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm not on video, but I can on. hear you. We can okay. hear you. Right. Uh, well, that was my question about the audit. I mean, but I would love to hear what the commissioners have to say. I 
mean, I really struggle with, you know, coming down from a, not necessarily struggle with coming down from a revocation. Um, but I really struggle with, you know, coming down from a revocation with kind of almost everything that they've offered. Right. Um, you know, I feel like if we found it necessary to consider revoking their license, um, I kind of think they should admit to all, you know, everything that we found or everything that we deemed, you know, worthy of a revocation. Um, I think that's pretty, you know, important, um, at least in my opinion. And, you know, I think the fine um, should probably be, you know, 20000 it just in my opinion, five thousand paid, you know, ten thousand st uh, stayed pending successful completion, and maybe five thousand stayed until when they want to reapply. If they do want to reapply um, for an ER license, as well. Like I just. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's within our right to counter. Yeah, I mean, I'm it, just wondering it, what it, everyone it, else. I think I think the first hurdle to get over is. You know, is this person appropriate to have a real estate broker license if they are right. not doing property management? And then yep. if you get over that hurdle, then we can talk about, you know, typically if you are staying a portion of the fine, you often maintain the entire fine and then, you know, okay. stay a portion. Um, if you want a larger portion paid, you can, you can do that. I mean, we you can counter on any one of those elements that you choose. But I think the first question is, you know, whether you think the individual is appropriate to hold a yeah. license. The, the prior two steps had to do with sales. So it's yeah. not, it, it's not just, I'm going to get rid of PM and it all goes away. Right. There are issues in both. And obviously when we looked at it previously, we thought there were major issues right. and to do what what we decided previously. So I'm not sure if we want to change our decision. Right. Yeah, I, I, my sense is that because the counter was so far apart and far away from what the commission had initially offered, my sense is we just reject it because there were so far apart. That's kind of what I'm thinking too. Yeah, I just don't have confidence in this respondent um, operating as a broker in general. So I would be inclined to reject the offer as well. Yeah. Can we, we just need a motion to that? Yeah, I just was wondering on complaint on the complaint from 2019 with the diversion. Mm -hmm. uh, they were both diversions. Um, I don't remember that, that case. If you give me one moment, I can pull up the stipulations and tell you, um, specifically. And I, I'm just wanting clarification just because they were both diversions, right? So they weren't, if, I'm just wanting to make sure that we're looking at all of it, I, I understand that there's previous action. I just want to make sure that we're in those two cases, it wasn't raised to a higher level of um, discipline. So I just want to make sure that we're looking at all the facts correctly. So in the uh, 2018 complaint number, what was read to the commission was the respondent represented a complaint in his purchase of his newly built property. The complainant alleged that the respondent misrepresented the amount of a verbally agreed upon co-op commission rebate to the complainant as part of the transaction. The investigation found that it appears the respondent failed to execute any brokerage relationship documents with the complainant and verbally agreed to a rebate amount that was not memorialized in writing prior to the closing and when was unable to produce a buyer's settlement statement signed by the respondent. And in that case, the signed stipulation for diversion 
included admissions to, um, uh, uh, let's see, um, 1210.217.1M, which is a violation of part two, part four, or a rule, the rule being commission rule E5, which goes back away to the E rules, which is uh, respondent failed to ensure proper closing of the transaction and to pro provide signed and um, closing statements. And also a 1210.408.2A, they were to disclose in writing the party to be assisted as a transaction broker. He paid a $750 fine plus the 15% and took coursework in contracts and brokerage relationships. And then his second one, and forgive me for this is too much information. Um, the second one involved, um, I can abbreviate this one and tell you that the second one involved the improper uh, handing out of the lockbox security code to a buyer and signed a stipulation for diversion. At the time, I believe there was not the specific rule, so he was found, he admitted to a violation of uh, demonstrating unworthiness and incompetence. He had a $500 fine and he was required to take a class in ethics. So those are the two previous ones. Okay. Can you, with their, uh, their accounts, property management accounts, are there funds still missing or is it, mm, you can't determine it because it's all a mess? And if I could get Charles to perhaps weigh in, that might be helpful and a little more accurate than my. Yeah, I think with the um, with the accounting, it's <clears throat> almost impossible to determine the security deposit liabilities because of his method of accounting is so incompetent that it was difficult to do that. He determined it in a very unusual way, um, but it was wrong. And there was still money diverted to, as you saw in the report, there was money diverted to 401ks, et cetera. I even think an outside firm would have a real problem. A forensic accountant would have a real problem straightening it all out. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, both of you, for that clear that um, background. So, do um, you have any more discussion? We're ready to make a motion. I move to reject the offer. Is there a second? Second. second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, motion passes for rejection of offer. Okay, the next one I have is in <clears throat> case number 2023-1510. Um, this, this complaint involved a fix and flip property that the respondent sold and failed to disclose evidence of previous water damage and potential mold issues. He was not the broker on the transaction, um, but he had an ownership interest and he was the employing broker for the broker who acted in the transaction. Um, you saw this at, I believe, your last meeting and you voted for a final agency order, a public censure, a fine of $5,000, coursework in ethics, and a 90-day suspension. And the respondent is asking for uh, your consideration. He's willing to accept the final agency order, willing to accept the fine, willing to accept the coursework, and asking if you'll reconsider the suspension. And the new information that I bring to you today is that he has worked with the buyer of the property and come to a settlement agreement with them 
in terms of some compensation in the amount of $10,000 to um, address some of the issues that have arisen in this property. And um, again, you can accept, reject, or provide alternative settlement authority if you choose. And I, I will add that in this particular case, I, I did not um, raise the issue of coming to any kind of agreement with the buyer or anything. That was something that he was working on independently with his, you know, attorney and trying to, trying to, um, would have, what, what sounded like a, a genuine attempt to kind of write a, a, a a wrong a situation. I, it, for me personally, I, I think the, the 10,000 is a, a good thing. That's something that he, they should have done anyway. I think the public center is still necessary. Um, if I'm remembering the, the case correctly. I mean, this person was out on social media, was doing videos. It, it just was a blatant. Was uh, that, the, that was the other, the broker, the, the actual listing broker, correct? Yes. No, that was this individual. I think you're remembering it correct, Michelle, is that um, there was a, I, I think this individual is in the business of, of, locating properties and, and rehabbing them. And there was some YouTube video of kind of walking through the property and identifying that, you know, oh, there's mold on the ceiling. There's some on the floor. There's, you know, I think we saw images of sort of water stains cascading, you know, along the wall from, from one location in the basement. And um, that's, and I was just, that's, it's the same person. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it is the same person. Yeah, that's that's the individual, and I'll. I think the difference was is that, um, you, you know, he was the owner of the property or, or ownership interest in the property, um, and and supervising the broker who handled the transaction. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, Michelle. Oh no, you're no, you're fine. That was all I had to say. Was I? Um, you know, the 90 day suspension, I'm, you know, I, I appreciate the goodwill of the $10,000. Um, but I definitely think the public center still needs to be there. Um, I, I agree, Michelle. I think that's, I, I could do that as well. I think the public censure is there for public protection, but we could forego the 90 day suspension. Anybody else have thoughts? And, and just just to be clear on the the public center piece and that's certainly something you can add back in back in and <clears throat> and counter back to him um, this is he is agreeing to a final agency order the final agency order document itself is attached to the license detail history of this individual so if the public looks him up they we that what they will see that stipulation what the public center will do in addition is sort of that one line notation in the quarterly industry newsletter. It would say the individual's name, final agency order, fine, coursework. Um, no more details than that. Um, it doesn't say what violations or anything. And so probably the better or the, the more important public protection piece is that it's, an, it's a final agency order and will be attached to his detail history with more details as to the violations that were found. Yeah, and I think that's what I was, I, I was about to pipe in and say, I think the, um, you know, given the 10,000, I, you know, I do think that coming down from public censure is okay, given that the FAO is still attached to the license. And, you know, I think it would inform more of the people we're trying to protect, um, you know, which is the general public, um, as opposed to, you know, informing other brokers as well. Um, so I would be inclined to accept the uh, settlement offer. Penny, can I ask you a question? 
Did you confirm with the buyer that they did get that 10,000? I have not been able to confirm yet, but that would could certainly be a part of not accepting this um, this offer until we get that. So I have a note to that on my, you know, in my in, in my notes here to confirm that prior to, but I have not been able to speak to them. I, I get what you're saying, Graham. Um, and I guess the sticking point for me is <clears throat> I don't I don't I don't know the the proper way to say this, but we want this not that the the five thousand isn't isn't hard, but we want this to have a lasting effect. Like the mold is not a joke. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you were publicly putting out that you knew that there was mold in the property, that you kind of, you know, um, were not truthful in this, in this transaction, it needs to hit home and not just with your paycheck, with your w writing a check. Um, I think public censure is a way of, of really making that hit home of like, yeah, I mean, nobody wants their name out there on that publication, but also nobody wants to live in mold and be lied to. So no, I, and I'm not downplaying mold or disclosure by any stretch at all. Um, you know, I'm just saying, I think someone who wants to find it, you know, if they want to look up working with this broker, they'll find it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, that's my struggle is I, I don't, I don't think there's any sure. I mean, if I just, I don't see, you know, coming down from public censure as not informing the public or saying mold isn't serious because mold is very serious. So on my, on my first read of this, I, I originally came out, I think where Graham is right now. Um, but might I propose um, we could uh, forgive the public censure, but reinstate the 90 day suspension. Would that be, would that be a, a suitable compromise? My, my personal feeling of, and this is just me, but my personal feeling of public censure is that too much is made of it. Um, it's in my eyes, it's like a temporary scarlet letter and memories are short. Yeah. And it goes in the publication once, um, but FAOs are permanent. They're, they are attached to that person's record forever. Well, the FAO is there regardless of the public censure. Right. I think the intent of this counter offer is to ask for, you know, I, in, in speaking with this individual, the biggest issue was the suspension and some of the implications, you know, they are employing broker and, and, you know, the complications that come with that. Um, so if, if you're willing to forego the suspension, given the new information of the additional, you know, sort of restitution, if you will, to the, to the buyer, um, we could ask to have the, you know, I could see if I could get the public censure back in. If he doesn't accept whatever new direction that you, you give, then, you know, they have the option of, you know, litigating this and taking it to the next step. So what about what would be okay with the probationary period as opposed to how we feel about doing a probationary period as opposed to a suspension? Yeah. And I think if Penny could confirm that the 10,000 has been paid and in order to, and then confirm that and then we could forego the public censure and we could do the 90 day probation. I mean, I'd go with like a year of probation. A year? Yeah. Okay. Joe, what are your thoughts? This is your final case. This is your <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no I'll just throw something completely different out now. Um, <clears throat> so with probation, it basically just says you just don't do anything else. 
correct? Is that what probation is? Um, don't get in trouble. <laughs> I mean, basically, yes. I mean, typically, probation allows you know the commission to add in other other terms. We often use it when you know somebody needs a high level of supervision or it's running concurrent with you know their criminal probation or something like that. But yes, it essentially is you know, another reminder that we are watching you and you need to comply with the license law, which you need to do anyways. Um, but I think it just adds sort of another layer of, um, this is important, this is serious. Um, and I, I, think, I think where you're going, Joe, is you're right. You have to comply no matter what, whether you're on probation or not. But I think it does, you know, just put another layer there of, informing that this was a significant issue yeah i mean i've no prior steps correct right I, um, this has been a broker for 22 years or almost 22 years at this point yeah i think the, them accepting final agency order is actually big um them you know agreeing to restitution for the buyer was big so I was, I'm okay with the counter proposal, honestly, as long as there is proof, yes, that the buyers received that payment. Yeah, that's a given. I would, you know, if you come up with anything alternative, I will make sure of that confirmation yeah. prior to executing a, a different agreement with him. Yeah, because I think, I think uh, they just signed that, that, agreement to pay that 10,000 at the end of March, wasn't it? The 11th, March 11th. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to see if they had like a pay by date in there, but I didn't see one. Yeah. Well, so how about if we accept the counter after we've confirmed that the money has been paid? Sounds good to me. I'm okay with that. Me too. All right. So we need a motion. I motion that we, oh, actually, Joe, you should do it. Yeah, Joe, you do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I motion to accept the counter proposal with the requirement that there is proof that the buyers were paid the restitution. Is All right. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Sorry, who was the second to that motion? Me. Thank you. <laughs> and with that being said, we are at the end of our commission meeting here on April 2nd. And I personally would like to thank both Josh and Joe for being such excellent counterparts. And um, the fun part is we don't always agree, but that's how it should be, right? right. <laughs> that's that's how a commission should run is we should not all agree on the same things all at the same time. So um, exactly. I I appreciate working with all of you. Um, Josh and Joe, you will be missed. And thank you so much for your service. And everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you.